Hello, my delicious co-creators. Lilou here. I'm in France, in Bordeaux, with delicious Jean-Pierre. It's so good to see you and so good to have you in Bordeaux. Thank you for making the effort to speak in English because I know this is not your first language. You're brilliant. He's brilliant at being interviewed in French. And I thought, he can speak in English. Let's try this because this is important information that I want to share with you. You know how much I love to create this bridge between the US and France and Europe and share this information. It needs to go through Atlantic. It needs to go to the US. This, this you need to hear this. Why? Because Jean-Pierre has this brilliant career, let's say, multi-careers as astrophysician, as a physicist. You've, you've, you've worked at, as the director of research at the CNRS. You have uh, published many books. You have published in peer reviews. You've been interested in these topics for 40 years. But what I'm interested to, to know here, and we're going to speak about UFOs, we're going to speak about extra, extraterrestrial beings, and why interstellar traveling is actually possible. And you discovered many formulas in a very uncommon way, let's say, or common way. Definitely, definitely. Yes. <laughs> so, so tell us, how, how did you get to this topic? I mean, what was the... You, so you were doing research on other stuff, and all of a sudden you got interested about UFOs? I'm going to hold this because I know you're, he's, he <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Yes, well, you know, it's normal for physicists to be interested in UFO's problem because the witness say, I've seen this object flying very fast at hypersonic uh, regime and I had Uh, I heard no noise, you know. So, is it possible to fly at supersonic velocity without sonic boom? That's the main problem. Mm -hmm. And so, I was involved in this Im immediately. Mm -hmm. And I, I directed a PhD thesis. We did many publications in peer reviewed journals. And that's important. I belong to the scientific community. I'm not external, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I published. It's unique, isn't it? Because I don't know if there's many scientists around the world that have this status. Well, I must be the only one, you know, only one who published uh, works directly connected to the UFO problem yeah. and inside the system, I mean in the peer-reviewed journal. Yeah. And that's very hard, I yeah. can tell you. <laughs> so what are the main things that you've been able to anchor in science about UFOs? And the first thing was this problem of uh, flight, hypersonic flight without boom. And, uh, you know... Uh, among the French scientific community that what considers or something silly, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, can we fly and remove the shock wave? You know, when you fly at supersonic velocity, you produce a shock wave. And that when a fl an airplane flies, you hear boom, the boom. Uh, 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 many people know that, you know. Is it, how is it possible to remove the shock waves? And it was considered that impossible. But, uh, you know, I was a specialist and that is called magnetohydrodynamics, MHD. The people begin just a little bit to know about that. Uh, MHD, what is that? It's a way you can act on a fluid with electromagnetic force. That's not magic trip, you know, that's just physics, you know. But you need strong magnetic field. It, you need uh, uh, several Tesla field. You cannot make that with a, a small magnet. You need something stronger you know? and then if you can act on the fluid with that you can remove the shock wave mm -hmm. and so it was demonstrated in a PhD thesis I, I published that and I was surprised because some guy said but you know it's silly no it's not silly mm -hmm. and in my uh, um, uh, career we found letters that were sent that were sent uh, from the direction of the CNRS to uh, American specialists and the meaning was just uh, we have a guy who thinks that he, he can remove the shock wave is he insane or not <laughs> so it wasn't you were not taken because that's quite strange you've tried many times i mean we'll talk about this in this interview also but you've tried many times to contact the US and be in touch with specialists and None of them really want to have a proper just conversation with you. I mean, it's... You know, MHD is a, a special kind of research. And it's closer to the Russian. For, I, I am well known in Russia, for example. When people go to laboratories, you know, you know Jean-Pierre Petit, uh, MHD. In America, it's not... Mm -hmm. uh, so the first subject was... Uh, the flight in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. 
but after uh, this system cannot achieve international travel. So, uh, as I was caught in this problem... You I really got caught right away? I mean, you got, it got your mind, huh? You cannot be back, you know. It's too, <laughs> it's too, no return. It's no return. <laughs> it's in a no return trip, you know. Uh, exactly. With a lot of trouble with uh, my hierarchy and so on. But of course. But I fought and I won. Wow. <laughs> All the time. Yeah. And then, so I, I had to uh, make an investment in mathematics, in the uh, differential geometry, uh, Einstein theory and so on. So, I got new knowledge about that, and now and then uh, the contact started. You know that's yeah. right, right, exactly. So you receive. So this is brilliant because you received information. Tell us about those contacts because some people say, "Oh, I've downloaded or I dreamt," but you, it's a bit different. You know, my life could be uh, could correspond to a movie of Spielberg. You know, it's really Spielberg movie. You know? I am Doc. It's even know? a spy. Yeah, a spy movie. Yeah. I am duck, like in, uh, back in the future, you know. So at, at first, uh, I was in contact with uh, what is called the Yumo Affair. The Yumo Affair was located in Spain. And in Spain, people received strange letters by mail. And uh, uh, someday, uh, a guy gave me this kind of papers. Uh, we had uh, 40 pages in Spain, we translated. And then I said... That's brilliant, you know. You have something there. So we went to Spain, and I started to have a travel all the time to Madrid, to Barcelona, to bring this guy. And so uh, what was this guy? Was who was this guy? I mean, he was giving you information. Where was this coming from? And this guy, you know, they received this letter since 1967 and uh, one was uh, an industrial uh, uh, policeman uh, you know uh, a small group com a dozen of persons and they received that i was only scientist. by mail by mail and i was the only scientist and then i said well i'd like to meet this guy <laughs> i want to be an ambassador you know <laughs> can i meet this extraterrestrial and at this time they had phone call with them so they answered well we have asked Good if it would be possible, uh, you could come to Madrid uh, someday uh, at this time at this hotel, and uh, we are we will arrange a meeting. Oh, okay. So, so they had met the extraterrestrial being, or they only had a contact by phone. Okay. But, uh, but here they wanted you to meet him in the hotel. Well, and so we went uh, with a friend. We went to this hotel in Madrid, and we waited the first day and first night. Nobody came, and then the second night. They came, <laughs> and then we were paralyzed, and he had a, a medical examination, you know. So I, I, I can, uh, I think that we are like uh, guinea pigs, you know. We're, we're guinea pigs. So, so uh, we went to become ambassador. We'd like to meet extraterrestrial. No, no, no. You, you, you don't deserve that. You are just guinea pigs. So we are going to see what you have in your brain, what you have in your, and so on. So, so they gave you. A little bit of information, little by little, a little bite through phone, through emails. I mean, they didn't. They, you didn't get it all at this at once. They tested you, no? First, they tested uh, physically, yes, and then the information arrived. And then at this time, I had a small computer. It's called a Macintosh. You remember the Macintosh? They were like s small boxes, and I had no connection with internet. The internet did not exist, so I had a hard drive. And on this hard drive, I was taking notes about physics and mathematics. And someday I was thinking about the logic, and then I received a letter from Saudi Arabia four days after, and it was written by this guy who pretended to come from another planet, and they said, oh, you have a brilliant idea, that's good, you are in a good direction, but how could they have the information that they put in my... And then I started uh, in, um, exchanges, I was asking a question in my computer and I received mailbox. And then there were phone calls. You know, I have not uh, recorded all this uh, um, agenda, but the important, the important thing was the content, you know. And this information contained uh, 
fantastic information uh, on the scientific point of view. For an example, in 1988, I was the first to publish in Modern Physics Letters A uh, a model describing the universe with a variable speed of light. It was never done before. Uh, they, they said, you know, you would make a progress if you would consider that the speed of light was higher in the past and it was decreasing. So I tried, I said, well, uh, speed of light varying in space, uh, I could uh, use it, uh, perhaps it's very like the inverse of the span of the universe. And then I went to Madrid and I said to a guy who had a phone call and I said, you know, I've tried this kind of problem with variable speed of light. He said, no, no, I have asked them by phone. It's not the good rule, you know. It's the inverse of the square root of the span of the universe. Ah, thank you. So I came back and it worked. And I made Like this? Exactly. And I made a publication with that. So, you know, it's a no return trip, you know, when you, you put your finger in that. <laughs> and Jerry, what do people, uh, I mean, those those... In those peer reviews, they must say, how did you come up with that? Do you explain how you get this information or you don't go there? Now you dare to say it because you're 82, but before that you wouldn't say the source, right? I, I did it many years after. And I remember uh, in a publication made in a very top level uh, journal, I made an acknowledgement, you know, and I, I said, I sang very much Professor Oxao, and I put the name of the extraterrestrial guy. And uh, they believed it was a Japanese thing. And then in my hierarchy, they said, you know what he does? He, un he gives an acknowledgement to extraterrestrial people. <laughs> that, was a, that was the first paper where you find acknowledgement to an extraterrestrial. Yes. Uh, I thank it, him very much for this useful uh, advice uh, and information. That's, That's daring, yeah. Yeah, the historical, exactly. It was in 1974, I, don't, I, don't, I remember something oh like that. Oh my God, they thought you were under LSD or something. Uh, and you, know, <laughs> you, you know, it's Spielberg story, you know. It is Spielberg, and I, my career was a career like the character of Spielberg, you know. Uh, because they gave more and more information about the structure of the universe. And, uh, like what? Tell us more discoveries and things that were published. Well, you know, it corresponds to the idea of Andrei of the Russian, but I'm deeply convinced that he had the contact with the same guys yeah. at the same time, you know, because you know what happened to Andrei Sakharov. Andrei Sakharov was a scientist, he invented the, the Russian H bomb. Mm -hmm. You know, he was involved in the military, uh, and then he received uh, probably a contact and letters. And they said, you know, you, you shouldn't do that, you know, th that's no good. And then he gave up on the military aspect, you know that, and he shifted to cosmology, uh -huh. like me, exactly. And he started to publish in 1967 papers like that. And then when I read that, I said, Sakharov has the same information as me. <laughs> But I had no money to go to Russia. I would like to meet Sakharov. I yeah. think if we had this meeting, yeah. Sakharov would say, Ah, oh, you received the letter too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we could compare our information. But what is the main information? The information is that the structure of the universe is different than the common uh, idea we have. Uh, and Sakharov used the theme of twin universes. Twin universes, he tried to manage that, saying that the universe is as a twin. And in this twin, uh, the, the arrow of time is opposite. That's uh, strange. One goes this way, the other goes the opposite. Exactly. And my, I manage that differently, but it uh, it goes with, with interstellar travel. travel. Interstellar travel is not possible within the classical general relativity because we have the limit of uh, velocity of the light. Uh, and then... Uh, speed of light, yeah. Exactly, speed of light. All the scientists, they say, it's not possible because if we could reach the next, uh, the, the closest star, it would turn 10 million years. No, no, you know, you have a second side of the universe. Uh, the good idea, if you take a piece of paper, you have one side and the other side. You can travel on the uh, upside and then you can travel on the down. And then the velocity of the light is different and the distance are different. And then the last computation shows that the velocity of light is 10 times higher and the distance 100 times shorter. Mm. You, you, you get a factor of 1,000 uh, uh, about the travel, trip, the travel time. So uh, the conclusion is uh, interstellar travel becomes feasible. That's, and there I have published 
enough paper to to introduce this this in the scientific yeah. community. And, and how deep is the universe? How big is it? It's as big as we can. It's, it's very large. But there's, I mean, there's there we can live on other planets, etc. Can you give us numbers? Well, in this other side of the universe, the mass are negative, and we you have only uh, clusters of negative mass. Uh, you know, in uh, 2017, there was a, a, an important paper published in the journal Nature, and this uh, uh, paper described a, a map of the universe at very large size. It was more than something like one and a half billion years. And then we have our galaxy at the center, and then you have that we call big attractor. A big attractor, it means you have a, one, one a thousand, a hundred thousand galaxies there, and so normally it attracts the matter. But at the other direction, at 600 million years, you have what is called the Great Repeller. The Great Repeller. The what? The Great Repeller. The Great Repeller. The Great Repeller. The Great Repeller is a place where there is no galaxy. It's a void. Yeah. And it repels the things. And my theory say in, in this place, you have a cluster of negative mass. And this cluster of negative mass, you cannot see it because negative mass emits negative energy photon. Because the energy is m multiplied by the square of the very speed of light, so we are not equipped to see negative energy photon. So the object is invisible. So you have observational evidence of this theory. Okay. So uh, in a paper I have published in 19, uh, 2018 in astrophysics and space science, we show that it explains a dozen of things. For example, you know that right now. You have dark matter. What is dark matter? Oh, that's very mystery. And then we have dark energy. Oh, dark energy. Yeah, it's, it's dark science. It's dark science. We are uh, we are thinking in the dark science. <laughs> well, and for example, uh, for the uniformity of the primitive universe, they have invented the inflaton. Inflaton is a small particle that makes the universe to expand. So we need dark matter, dark energy, and inflaton, and so on. What else? Mm. So here you just need to change the geometry of the universe and it explains all these things. So I have presented that in an international meeting, but you know, uh, the specialists are very straight-laced about that, you know, they, have, they are scared because Im imagine I uh, meet a guy specialist in cosmology and he would say, ah, oh, Dr. Petit, I'm glad to meet you, the theory is interesting, but what about my own work on dark matter? Oh, my poor man, <laughs> you just give it, you throw that. Ah, yeah. oh, yes, and uh, what about dark energy? Same thing, you know. <laughs> So dark matter, it doesn't exist. You know that dark matter, you have had uh, a lot of uh, attempts to, to show the evidence of this object. For example, they have installed a laboratory in mines uh, at uh, two and a half miles deep uh, to protect from the cosmic radiation. And they have also uh, laboratories in the tunnels with a big rock uh, mass uh, above, and it doesn't work, not at all, no, no particles. So the information that you're bringing is disturbing, to say yeah, the least. Very, terribly disturbing. You know, you know when Einstein bought his theory, it was just a sophistication to uh, uh, la uh, Newton's theory. You have Newton's law, and uh, we could describe the path of the planet around the sun. And you know that Mercury had a strange uh, behavior. It was moving, its, its ellipse was moving, but it's very small, you know. So Einstein explained that, but you could, anyway, uh, have a good description of the universe with Newton's law. It doesn't break, it doesn't destroy the Newton's law, no. It just gives a little sophistication. but. The model of the universe, I call it Janus. Janus, you know, Janus is a king, he's a, he's a god, he's a god, ancient god. Mm -hmm. And when you find uh, th this god, he has a particularity. He looks towards the future and towards the past. Mm -hmm. You have these two faces. Mm -hmm. It's not, he has not two, visi two, two visages, but he looks to the future. Two faces. Two faces. But he looks towards the future and towards the past. And it corresponds to this thing, uh, of course. You mean it corresponds to the vision of the universe that you receive? Exactly. exactly. Uh, 
it, you know, it arises uh, from like for the ancient Egypt. Where does it come from? <laughs> Why do they? well? Yeah, actually, actually, I'm doing a little uh, side note, but if you want to check the video that we've just done on Egypt as well, you can go and see it because it's uh, he reveals also his uh, out of body experience where. He was an engineer on site of the pyramids and he got some formulas that actually work mathematically and, and it's, a, it's another... But going back to Janus, J-A-N-U-S, so tell us about that. Well, uh, uh, as I told you, in 1967, they said that the arrows of time were yeah. opposite. So what is the meaning of two arrows of time? A, bit, a French mathematician uh, showed in 1970 that it just means that the mass is reversed. S to say that a particle goes to the future, to the past, inside of the future, it means that it has a negative mass. So it was clearing the problem completely. But now we could go back to the incidents. <laughs> mm -hmm. Then, uh, for an example, uh, one night uh, during the 80s, I was. Uh, I just want to figure out this just the Janus because you've done tons of videos online in French. They're not in English. Okay, they, have subtitles. they have English subtitles. Okay, you have Janus videos. You have 30 videos. So you explain that in great depth. Okay. But you know, you take aspirin and you, you yeah. look at it. 30 hours. Yeah. 30 hours of uh, watching. Okay. But after watching this video, you will not be the same, you know. Yeah. It will change connection in your brain. <laughs> you, you will think differently. Yeah. 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 Differently. Yeah. But, you know, this goes with uh, some parallel life. For example, uh, one day I was in my house in Pertuis after the lunch. And then I had to sleep. And I slept uh, 12 or 14 years. 14. Uh, yeah, Jean-Pierre lives south of France yeah. in Pertuis. So I, I had a, uh, on, une sieste. You had a nap. And a, a long nap. And then by night I woke and I said, "Wow, I have slept a lot of time." And then I removed my. Twelve hours later. Yeah. Yes, uh, twelve hours. Later. And then I removed my la my uh, sweatshirt and discovered a scar. I had a scar. Right there. Right there. Right there. Exactly. Nearby the umbilicus. Exactly. And this scar wa was. Uh, you, uh, Comment on dit? J'avais une, une trace rouge et deux hématomes. Tu vois? Comment there tu dirais was, ça? There was like uh, a red mark with uh, two like uh, not bruises but two uh, big uh, d d clogged. Uh, uh, yeah, I can't find the name in English, but yeah. you can scratch, you can be scratches, or you can be hurt, but the both together it's difficult. So uh, I had this kind of thing, and then uh, some of my books were published in Japan. So I had a translator, Nakajima, Dr. Nakajima, who translated my books, and then during his uh, uh, come on, uh, l'année, uh, l'année uh, sabbatic, sabbatic life. He, he had a uh, sabbatical, uh, sabbatical uh, yeah. year uh, yeah. during sabbatical. He decided to come to France, and then he was supposed to arrive in France. And then on Sunday, he called me by phone. Uh, Hello, uh, uh, Doctor Petit. Ah, Doctor Nakajima, you, you have arrived. Yes, I have arrived. But uh, could you come at my home? Ah, come at your room, uh, it's nine o'clock, oh, wh what is so important, we are going to meet, no, no, can you come immediately, immediately, uh, uh, what for? It's difficult to explain by phone, huh? So I take my car, I come to his house, I ring, he opens the door, he says, Dr. Petit, the scare, I have the same. <laughs> the same scar. Exactly. Same exact scar than you overnight or in several hours. Exactly, exactly, yeah. So what, so what did you do with this? What could we do, you know? What could we do? What, 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 did, what do you think happened? He took picture, that's all. Well, so, uh, 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 the mark is still visible. And you still have it on you. I, I still have it. So, when I asked myself, well, all that, was it a dream? Was it a mythomania and so on? No, I have just to remove my shirt. I see the scar, and I cannot make a scar like that without a knife, you know. And then for you, the scar is, is contact with the extraterrestrial. What could they have done? Well, you know, a dozen years after, we were uh, flying back from Egypt with my wife, and then my wife said, "You know, you have something strange on, on your body," and I had 
uh, hernia, hernia, you understand what it is? Uh, hernia uh, there, and then it's common for for men uh, when they get older, uh, they have a small hernia. So I showed to my doctor who said, well, you know, you are, we are going to close that. So you go, I know a man who is a surgeon in Aix-en-Provence, so I went to this guy and then he said, okay, remove your shirt, okay, you have this, uh, we are going to, to repair that uh, the day after. But what's that? And then I didn't answer. So he said, you know, I'm going to open your, uh, your body uh, within two days. You must tell me the truth. Where the scarf was? Yes. Well, he saw the scar and he, he immediately realized that it was a deep scar because when you touch it, you understand that there is something inside. It's not a thing that you can make with a cat, you know, nothing. So I told him the, star, the story and uh, he laughed, you know. If I, well, he smiled, he smiled. He, he, he just thought he probably had a problem with a relative and uh, he invented this story to, to, yeah. to hide that. So two days after, we were going to the, the, the place for the operation. Uh, it was complete anesthesia. And then... For the surgery. For the surgery. And then I, I was uh, walking, come on, on se réveille, une salle de réveil. Tu woke up, yeah, in a waking up room or whatever. Yes, and, uh, and then I had a small box in my hand, tr transparent box, you know, the things you use to, to uh, um, analyze your, your urine, you know, with a uh, red cover. You, every, this is common in any place in the world. And I said, what's that? And uh, the nurse said, oh, is this that we found inside? <laughs> <laughs> it was an implant, right? Exactly, uh, about two cubic centimeters. And uh, she, she so you were not that surprised? <laughs> but she, she took the box and she said, we have to analyze that. Yeah. Because, you know, when you open the body of somebody, when you find something strange, you have to look if it's not cancer, if you are not cancer cell. If there are no cancer cells, they remove it, they put it in the garbage. But I said, you know, you're not right, it, it, it's my property. <laughs> <laughs> Describe the implant. Uh, well, at this time I lived in Brussels. Though, so the, the day after I took an airplane and I went back to, to Belgium. So I had just a contact by, with uh, uh, the surgeon. He said, well, don't worry, this is correct. You have no cancer cell. But uh, what have you done with this uh, object? Oh, we removed it. You know. it, it, went to the, oh, it went to the garbage. So we will never know what's inside. But you know, can you describe it from the outside? You know, it was like like fat. You know, two, two cubic centimeters. You know, I don't know. Uh, I, I met a guy uh, two or three weeks ago. Uh, we had a, uh, we we was abducted, and he said, you know, the scar. I had the same at the same place. So what is, is what is located is exactly there, but uh, and then uh, I had another problem with files in his house. Well, I don't pay so much attention with that, but uh, we are like guinea pigs, you know. Sometimes, perhaps uh, one uh, uh, definitely not the most intelligent of this universe. Huh? Well, but you know, uh, one. Uh, um, one kind of extraterrestrial, they say, oh, you know, they have put uh, an implant to him. He must be an interesting guy. So uh, put an implant too. <laughs> so I have, I have a, a, a tooth, probably, you know. But we know what is important. Why would they be important since they can reach you in many different ways and receive information from you? Why those implants? I'm sure you try to make a meaning of all this because you love, you're curious, you love researching, and you must have a theory. Since since you since at 82 you tell everything about everything now, right? <laughs> You're not holding back at all, right? <laughs> no, but I have no answer about this implant. What is it, what, what is he used for? Okay. So what is important for me is uh, scientific information. Yes. Scientific information, you know, you have the hard and the soft, you know, in, in computer. That's the soft, and this soft this is more important because when or oh, you know someday. Uh, they they phoned me, and they said you have a problem with the Schwarzschild solution of the Einstein equation, and uh, well, this is a peculiar problem of mathematics, but it was unsolved since one century, and they said uh, we we are going to give you a solution. Uh, what solution? So you make this kind of a change of the variable, 
So I took notes, and it works. And I published that in a peer-reviewed journal. And this is sophisticated. So I will, I will not talk about that in this interview because it's too sophisticated. But if I am in a seminar, I could say to my colleague, you remember this problem, you have two singularity in this uh, solution. So we are going to remove the two singularity. Incredible. How do you do that? Well, I use this formula and you magic. Oh, everything is cleared up. Well, what does this com formula come from? I can't say, you know, one day I, I walk and I said, I, should, I could use that. No, no, it's too sophisticated. So this is a mathematic, mathi mathematical formula and we can't we can build the origin of that. The only on origin I could say, you know, someday I had a phone call and a guy who pretended to come from another planet, he gave that, you know. What are they, what do they want then? That's mathematics from elsewhere. Yes. Mathematics from elsewhere. Yes. It's more important than an object. You could see I have an object and his object come from, that science coming from another planet. Yes. Is that just soft? That's a publication. So why why would they send you send you all those mathematic formulas? I mean, those are very uh, advanced, let's say, right? And this is probably even very minor compared to all the information they want to share or send us. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why do they send information? You know, uh, I am a scientist, oh, so I can convert yeah. this information into classical science not exact science, and can move the scientific community because this scientific community has to be moved. You know, we cannot keep the solution, keep the position. Some say, you know, the UFOs, they don't exist because they should make a shockwave. No, we can't remove, we can't cancel the shockwave. It has to be proved experimentally. Well, about this particular question, uh, during the 80s, I tried to uh, achieve an experiment about that. I, m I met the, the director of the CNRS at the t top level, and he said, what could we do? So we could use a shock tube. A shock tube is a, shock, is a wind tunnel that sends uh, uh, a gaze at 10,000 degrees and high pressure, it's necessary to have such temperature to have a good electrical conductivity. And when I made a lot of experiments with my own shock tube during the 60s in my laboratory, and then we could produce a shock wave without ob uh, uh, obstacle, mm -hmm. without, you know, that was the, the evidence. If I can produce a shock wave with no object, mm -hmm. I can remove the shock wave around the object. Mm -hmm. So I said to the guy, we have computed all that and we would like to make the experiment. At this time, I was in charge in an observatory of uh, uh, Marseille, so I had no lab. So uh, they had a contact with a, uh, a guy who had a, a shock tube and we tried to uh, build this experiment. But the army, uh, made it impossible. You know, you have an expression in English, you know, it's easy to pull a cat out of the bag, but you cannot put it back, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. exactly. They didn't want to, to pull the cat out of the bag. Yeah. Because suppose we have removed this experiment, uh, we have cancelled this wave, it was a solid result, you could publish that, and it could make the UFO problem to arise in the scientific uh, world, you know. And that would have a lot of implication, obviously. Exactly. I, I, in, including a military implication. Because uh, when you have a cruise missile, you know, this cruise missile, uh, for an example, the Tokamak, uh, it cruises at subsonic velocity because the supersonic velocity will cause a drag. And uh, the supersonic cruise missile have a very short range. Uh, uh, a Tokamak has a... Uh, two or three thousand miles uh, range and the supersonic are very short. So if you could remove the shockwave, you could have very long range uh, cruise missile. That's for this is, but you know, the information coming from UFO have military implication, evident, of course. You can make weapons. Yeah. And uh, I was not... You, you used it, let's say, well, this information, because in the hands of a bad guy, 
this, this could have turned bad, right? And I didn't want to become a bad guy. No, you know? no, no, impossible. You know, I, I was too too young for that. You know? <laughs> they could not uh, buy me by money or anything. And no, of course. Yeah, there's many ways of pressuring and many ways of... Because um, there's a lot of um, misinformation, let's say, about this. Because you could be discredited discredited or die pretty quickly. You were threatened, I guess, or what there was nothing that they could do. What they wanted, it was to put all this research in secret laboratories. Yeah. And you know, how do you the Russian? Uh, Putin. Putin gave a lecture. They uh, talked at the Duma uh, one year ago. One year ago, and he said that the Russian has uh, developed a personic missile. You know that, mm. and they are they are in advance, and they are these are um, MHD missile. He can remove the shockwave because if you don't remove the shockwave and if you have an hypersonic missile that crews in dense air, it's impossible because the temperature grows too much, you know. And I made a, a lecture, I made a movie, I made a video in English about that. Uh, you can find that probably in, in, in YouTube. And I explained that. And you know, the Russian know me. You know, I am one of the most brilliant specialists in MHD. Really, I have made experiments very sophisticated, and you work it. All my experiences work it as a first trip. That's all. Well, of course. Well, well, why uh, about the pressure? Well, there are many things. You know, uh, you, you you can say this guy will not not a penny for him. Of course, during 30 years, I had no money to go to international meetings. You can't imagine how I, I managed the participation to. Uh, I, I had to be inscribed in tourist tours in, in Russia. So I was arriving in Moscow and uh, uh, on this day uh, the agenda was to visit the Lenin grave. Uh, and I said to the lady, you know, I'm sorry, can I follow the uh, um, Russian university? What for? Because I have a speech to give in, in two hours. But we are in tourist trip, well, okay. So I missed the visit to Lenin grave. That's all. Yeah. And then I called my uh, my friend Golubev. Ah, Golubev, Jean Pierre, you are here. Yes, we send you a, a car immediately. <laughs> so you, you understand? Well, yeah. uh, well, so no, many adventures. <laughs> so many, no money at all. No, no money at all. But you're finding a way, but it stopped you obviously. But you continued, as you said, your main thing is pen and paper. This at least nobody can get that out. Of Freedom is pen and paper. You know, and we spend on paper. I could fight. You know, you you could represent me with a paper fighting. <laughs> <laughs> and they tried anything they could. You know, to crush to crush me. Yeah, but, but you you're know, still alive because some were dead. Yes, but I'm I'm strong. You know, <laughs> I can't resist. But because I I, I shifted to pen and paper to theoretical work. Theoretical work you cannot. Uh, stop a guy. Um, if you, you had to shift many times, actually. That's very interesting in what you had to do to be able to live and continue to spread information and continue your research. You had to learn new things. You had to overcome difficulties. I mean, you, you n nothing would stop you because you would grow inside. You would learn. Yes, but you know, this is a, a fascinating problem. Imagine you have a contact with a guy who come from an extraterrestrial uh, uh, planet and they give you scientific uh, uh, information. You, you cannot resist that, you know. I, I think... I, I you, but in other people's hands, they might not have done the same. But they, yeah. they would be deadly scared, yeah. you know. But, well, I'm not scared, you know. I, I was a, a safari a conductor in Kenya in the past. Uh, I, I could you scuba dive to research like deep uh, sharks and so on. Yes, you know I am an adventurer, so I was an adventurer since uh, when I was very young. And then science it must be an adventure. If it is not an adventure, it's boring. You know, oh, it's, it's, it's that simple. Yeah. Right. So you know this kind of things. And uh, uh, any time they gave me information more and more sophisticated. And the last one was uh, in uh, 2016, uh, one night, about metaphysics. Well, th th something else, you know. So. What do you mean at night? You received a call, an email, or it was a dream? Call, 
Oh, no, no, it was a phone call. Phone call. Well, say, uh, hello. No number. <laughs> you know, no, no, no. Do you know they call at three o'clock? I think this is uh, the, the the time they work. Uh, they I noticed. I noticed with you, Jean Pierre, uh, that three is a big number because our video in French was fifty-three minutes, both in two different languages without watching the time, and these videos were both thirty-three minutes. The previous one, when I looked at my camera, I know three is a big one. Yeah, but uh, three. This is, this is for a laugh, but honestly, this is like synchronicity. Three in the night must be the time they work, you know, so they take off. The, and then they say, oh, I'm sleeping, yes, but take that in us, it's important. Yes, but could you call uh, during daylight, uh, daytime? Well, so the last information was, you know, uh, the geometric vision of the, of the universe is not the Einstein vision, it's more sophisticated. And you know, what is the great. Uh, paradigmatic jump at the beginning of century. What what was the main idea of uh, Einstein? What Einstein says is the universe is not designed like you think. Uh, we live in a Minkowski space, in a Minkowski space time. For the specialist, this sentence contents everything, including the limitation to the speed of light. Well. So uh, the uh, sentence in 2016 was. Consider you live in a hermit space. Hermit space? Yes, it's a complex Minkowski space. Well, if some guy learned this video he has some uh, uh, knowledge in mathematics, uh, mathematics you have Minkowski space, and if you take a complex Minkowski space, then it becomes hermit space. Oh, yes. And then you use a method of Suryo for, the, for this kind of thing. And you know, what was fascinating in, in the, in the extraterrestrial ID is that the matter had two components. We had positive matter and negative matter. So you had two kinds of matter. But then you have four. And you have two kinds of matter that... And two matter matters. Yes, <laughs> to, yes. And they, they form the metaphysic world. Right. They form the metaphysical world. So you have two worlds. You have the physical world, we belong to, and you have the metaphysical world. And it was with special... There is another meta-interview. <laughs> this is meta, yeah. <laughs> yes, but you know, for me, I, I, I would like to say this too much, you know. You ask me to, to explain that to people. And, uh, uh, it's huge. Uh, it's, it's huge. It's really huge. Yes. You know, the uh, shockwave constellation, peanuts. Uh, even the interstellar travel, just gadget, you know. Yeah. But metaphysics, that's something, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, and you know, uh, uh, philosophers said in the past, metaphysics is like a big lake, and to cross this lake, we have no boat. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, they offer the boat and the motor, and I say, come aboard, <laughs> we're going to cross that. <laughs> so I, I was supposed to explain that in a meeting uh, devoted to mathematics, and the guys arranged to eject me from this meeting. Incredible. Well, the fight is just beginning there. And I have published that in a peer journal again, you know. It's a solid mathematics. That's the that's most sophisticated work I never did. Mm. I have to explain that to people. To explain, you know, there is a life after death. And it, you can, we can demonstrate that by mathematics. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. So I am a good client for you. Yeah, there's so much that so much she can share with us, and and obviously I'm very grateful for this. And I think the timing is great because, as you know, I just gave birth three months ago, and it's absolutely, it must. I knew we must done this interview now and share this with you. So I hope you will spread this interview. I hope you will share it because it is really a huge. Effort. I mean, the whole universe conspired for us to meet now. Nassima Ramain put me in touch with you, said you have to interview Jean-Pierre Petit. He's 82 years old. I mean, he looks like in his 60s, but he's 82. Yes, two time, you know, 82. You must hurry. Huh? Yeah, he yeah. said you must interview him now, even though he's very young at heart and a lot of energies and you continue to do many things. But you might not see actually the impact before you die. 
you might not see the impact of all your work. I'd like, huh? to, I'd like, yeah. I'd like to, but so, uh, this is, so we're sending you uh, be in touch if if you're influential, if you're a publisher, if you're if you have some information, if you don't hesitate to contact Jean Pierre through his website and his email. He's easy to find and to okay. contact. And uh, yeah, come to the state and to explain that you yeah, know. He's ready to come, and that's a big one for him. Take an example. Perhaps you know Michaud Kaku. Michaud Kaku. Mm -hmm. Kaku is a, a, an American from from a Japanese origin and he's a scientist and, and explain many things about the universe. I would like to face Michio Kaku because he can understand what I do. And that's a good thing. Yeah, you know? and have like a talk and that it should be uh, televised. I'm ready to take my camera and do this. But you know, you must know something that in the United States you have information and you have disinformation. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, like everywhere in France like too. Everywhere. Yeah, everywhere. But uh, inf disinformation in France is just we don't talk. Right. That's silence, silence. And it says it goes uh, further. It means you have guys like St Stephen Greer, for example. Stephen Greer is this information. You have uh, videos that seem very interesting. There is nothing inside. You know? and, uh, You're saying it's fake, yeah? Yes, yes. Yeah, you have a lot of fake, a lot of fake. Yeah, so how to know when it's real or not real? How to... How, to, how do we know us as non-scientists you know when it's real not real i mean the, the real tool that we can listen to is our heart and if it feels right or not because otherwise you know there's how do you go about all this something is happening right now uh, as a scientist i have a lot of work so you have the specialist you have the public who is not able to understand that but between the two, you have engineers, you have students who had a minimum mathematic background. And I started to make, to give this information in this video. And if you look at the video Janus, you will see you have PDF file. PDF file for guy who knows a little bit about mathematics. Do you know what is a logarithm? Do you know what is an exponential? Do you know what is a differential equation? Do you know the basic tool for the mathematics that uh, every student has and the guy begin to read that and when you have done you have looked at the computation the guy say what he says is strong but the specialists they don't want to read they don't want to hear you know uh, uh, incredible you know you, uh, can you imagine since 2014 i cannot present my work in seminar in france in all laboratory no answer I would like to present my work in the uh, observatory, laboratory, surgical physics. They don't answer. They are deadly scared. Mm. Because I am a guy like uh, Clint Eastwood for surgical mathematics, you know. I can put a serum between your two eyes at uh, 10 meters, like yeah. that. Yeah, well, you have the answer. Yeah. I have the answer. No, I, ne I never, comme on dit, jamais perdu un combat. I never lost a fight. I never lost a fight. And they know that. I'm dangerous. <laughs> yeah, because you and you, and you're a lot, you have a lot of humor and fun, and you do it for the right reason. So this is very strong. Thank you, Jean Pierre. I know we can speak also about the different uh, things that you have uh, invented and all that. But we'll do some other videos about it. Um, it's getting really warm here in France. We have a whole big heat wave, so we're doing this video in the morning. But right now the sun is starting to rise. So. Time to say bye bye and to ask you to share this information and to do whatever we can to co create this because there's something big happening. We need you. We need you. We need you. Yes. So we send you lots of love and um, speak to you soon. Bye, my delicious co creators. Much love. Thank you, Jean Pierre.